The opinions expressed by the host and guests on Where Did the Road Go are their own and do not represent those of WVBR or its management. Our aim is to explore the fringe, lost civilizations, alternative science, the paranormal, and much more. Join us on the web at WhereDidTheRoadGo.com where you can send us questions for our live or future guests via email or the live chat room. And remember to subscribe to us on iTunes. And now welcome to this week's edition of Where Did the Road Go? Tonight on Where Did the Road Go, we have uh, we have someone we were going to have on last month and we had to reschedule. We have a David Metcalf tonight. And uh, David, are you with us? I am. Thanks for having me on, Soraya. So you are, do you want to tell people a little bit about what you do? Sure. Um, I'm a contributing editor to Reality Sandwich and The Daily Grail. Um, I write regularly for Disinfo, um, and I focus on kind of consciousness culture, but sort of the, the weirder end of consciousness culture, and uh, also, on the flip side, the more scientific end, so uh, parapsychology and psi, um, and I do, I, I do quite a bit, so I'm, I'm very much into the idea of transmedia, where, uh, you know, I write where I can and get the ideas out and encounter the ideas where I can, so. Okay. And you haven't written any books on it? No, I've been published a couple times in different anthologies, um, but I have not compiled anything into a book yet. Any plans to do so? Uh, I've, there's an opportunity coming up that I may be uh, co-authoring a book with uh, Andrew Chestnut on Santa Muerte. Um, and Andrew's the uh, chair of Catholic studies at Virginia Commonwealth University, who wrote Devoted to Death, um, which is one of the first English treatments of the Santa Muerte tradition. So, and what is that tradition? Uh, Santa Muerte is a saint that I mean, it translates as Saint Death. Um, Santissima Muerte, which is another name that she's known by, uh, translates as Most Holy Death. And she is a folk saint in Mexico, um, mainly predominant in northern Mexico, uh, that's become very contentious in the, uh, in the media and to law enforcement and officials um, because of her ties to narco culture and uh, criminality. But um, one of the things that Andrew and I are trying to highlight is that really she comes out of the, um, just the environment that has grown, I mean, Mexico has been heavily affected by the drug war, the economy is affected by that, and uh, Santa Muerte, as this patron saint of uh, holy death, has kind of become the patron saint of dispossessed, and um, there's, a, there's a much deeper story than what the media is portraying her as just this narco saint and this, uh, you know, kind of satanic death figure. Um, she actually is more oriented towards mothers who are concerned with their children. Um, cops, uh, you know, have her, have her uh, devotional items on them to protect them, you know, talismans and that, uh, jail guards, you know. So it's not just narcos that are, that are young mothers, taxi drivers, grandmothers, you know. It's, it's very much a, a patron saint of the dispossessed. So um, it, unfortunately, the U.S. media has gotten a hold of it and it kind of used it to heighten immigration fears and uh and that so it's become a kind of contentious strange uh folk tradition that and the other unfortunate thing with that is that people in the u.s encountering her um you know there is a potential because it is a saint of death to have uh you know negative consequences if people start creating a tradition around her that focuses on violence and that the way it is in mexico right now that's not necessarily the case uh, the media is trying to make it look like that, and so, you know, there's some concern about getting the actual information before, you know, a satanic panic starts or, or something silly like that, so. All right. Um, how did you get involved in all this stuff? Uh, I've had a weird upbringing. Um, I've been fortunate that uh, in my just, you know, straight schooling and high school and that, that I always had teachers that kind of fostered my interest in the weirder stuff. Um, you know, in high school, I had an English teacher that encouraged me to do a, an oral report on the alchemical tradition. Um, in third grade, I had a teacher that encouraged me to read Thomas Mallory and uh, Edgar Allan Poe in that. 
so all throughout my life, I've kind of just been allowed to explore those areas. And then um, it was actually George Hansen, um, who I met through Bill Sweet, that, uh, you know, in talking to him, I started to move out of more, uh, you know, just hobbyist enjoyment to actually writing about it and engaging it. Um, and through college, I've got a background in cognitive philosophy. So, uh, you know, using that and comparative religions. So using those tools, you know, coming at the, the subject in, oh. kind, in kind of a in kind of a loose way, because I, you know, I've got professionally I have a, a decade's worth of marketing <laughs> and corporate marketing as my background. So, you know, taking it from the hobby level, I was able to bring some skills to it that, you know, normally people wouldn't have. So just kind of going full on researcher, uh, you know, and using the digital media space to explore that stuff. Did you ever study any more on alchemy? Yeah, I, uh, I've got a loose affiliation through a website called The Art of Transformations um, with the International Alchemy Guild. Um, and uh, I've been fortunate to meet Dennis Hauck, who uh, is their acting president. Um, so I do, I do definitely study and engage those ideas. I don't do any practical alchemy. Um, I haven't had <laughs> I haven't had the the resources or space to get a, an actual lab up, but um, definitely engage with the ideas on a meditative level. Well, isn't that a, level. isn't that where a lot of it is though? Is is on the mental level, on the symbolic level? Yeah, that's the interest. I don't you know. There's studying the parapsychology stuff has given me some interesting questions about the alchemical thing because you have you know, through Jung and that kind of stuff, you have this idea of, you know, spiritual alchemy, which definitely I, I do think there, there was at certain times that tradition, you know, it had kind of a yoga, you know, like a yoga aspect to it. Um, but I think that one of the ideas of the transmutation may be, and this is kind of like a far out idea, but the idea with parapsychology and the alchemy, it may be a tie between like stuff like psychokinesis and your experimentation and your meditation. So I have questions if there isn't like something a little bit more going on, you know, which uh, that would be an experiment. I'm not saying that that's necessarily possible, but, you know, looking at what was being written about what the people were doing and the effect that they had in larger culture. Um, I think it goes I think it goes pretty deeply into a physical and practical sense, you know. Yeah. OK. Well, that's interesting. A lot, a lot of the people I've talked to that are involved in alchemy at all generally just put it in that that sort of uh, mental state like it's the spiritual alchemy and dismiss all the other stuff right yeah and that you know i mean that i think there there is yeah and that, it's weird because it comes from you know i mean you can go back to the the older stuff and see both you know and there and i mean the the arguments over the physicality of it versus the spirituality of it you know they've been going on since you know alchemy was coined as a term so but I mean, if you look back at its ties to uh, to like, Egyptian uh, ideas, alchemy in the Egyptian sense was very much, uh, you know, working with metals and working with chemistry. So it comes out of a very physical uh, science. However, if you look at the the mythopoetic elements that you find in like the the uh, pyramid texts, you, there's some interesting questions that start to come in where you know what exactly, how did these things combine? You know, because the um, like with Empedocles and classic chemistry, you've got a spiritual level that's worked in there. There's no, we don't have, they never had those separations. You know, it's very much a whole. So trying to look back on that and think, you know, the how does the spirituality become physical and the physical spiritual? You know. Yeah. And then, uh, which again, I think it's a it's a much more integral question. And that's, I mean, there's a lot of interesting stuff with the spiritual alchemy, but I think they miss, they miss something if they don't approach it at a physical level as well, you know, because I mean, again, even with the Greeks or something, you look at Greek statues, um, they're based on ideal forms, but they're sculpted into a physical reality. And the idea of like athletes and that kind of stuff, there was always this idea of sculpting the physical towards the ideal, bringing the ideal down to the physical. So I think in just taking it on a spiritual level, you can miss you know, a lot of potential that's there, especially in terms of applying it to, um, you know, social action and being involved in society with those ideas. Okay. Um, and now you were talking about how the media twisted uh, the one uh, faith there around. 
the one saint. Um, how much of an effect do you think media has on us as a people? I mean, I, I would think it has an extreme, <laughs> an extreme. It sculpts our reality. You know, I um, I just made a move from Chicago to Georgia, and you know the the media of the around the South and the kind of mediated idea of the South is so far different from what the reality on the ground is um, for, you know, good and ill. And I think that, you know, just, just in looking at that, I've done a lot of traveling in the past uh, like year and a half and um, thinking about the media vision of what America is versus what driving through it and actually experiencing it is and experiencing people's lives, you know, and, and also being um, active in the media and having a decade's worth of marketing. I've seen firsthand, you know, how much of our reality is sculpted and how powerful those tools are for sculpting our reality, you know, especially in terms of, I think that the way that it really works is in building the stories, the narratives that we work with in our lives, you know. Hmm. Okay. It's, if we're, I mean, we're very narrative creatures. So you think of like, what, what's our, our identities of family and all that? Those are all based on stories that we share. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And then the ability for for the media to kind of create like artificial stories, tie our tie our experiences into that. You know, it gets down to creepy. You know, um, creepy levels of where they can your memories get hijacked by you know, archetypal kind of images being shown to you, you know, that you can reflect back on, on your own memory. So like a commercial that shows, you know, like an idyllic childhood, like if that cues in on some memories that you may have, suddenly you feel more, uh, you feel closer to that product or that idea, you know, and I think that's really invasive. So. Well, it also seems that the media will use its influence on people. They'll, they'll like, for instance, say something that they, they want to be true, that they know isn't, and retract it later. But when they retract it later, no one notices. It was that initial burst that gets into people's, right. into people's heads. Right. There's a, there's a great book called uh, The Book of Jerry Falwell, which is by, uh, it's by a, an academic who was studying the, the use of biblical language as a tool for manipulating culture. And uh, she gave some great examples where Jerry Falwell would say something completely outrageous, like just like like especially in the, you know, during he said some really like outrageously racist things. Um, then he also said uh, just some completely things that never came true, making prophecies or claims that never came came true. But when he, uh, you know, when he kind of readapted that and just threw out some biblical terms and some, you know, kind of mixed them around. Uh, when the people were asked, you know, and shown, here he said this, here he said this, you know, these are kind of divergent ideas. The people were like, oh, well, he can't do anything wrong. He's a prophet. And it was just this idea of him being a prophet that completely allowed him to say whatever he wanted, you know. And if you think of celebrity and that, you know, or in any kind of uh, leadership, that that pass is kind of given, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um the media just seems like it has more of a negative effect on us today than a positive one. It just seems to be almost mind controlled to some degree. Well, it's such empty messages. You know, I mean, that's the, it's, it's just, it's, it's garbage. I, I hadn't, I hadn't watched TV in so long. And uh, in the move, uh, we were in a hotel and turned on the TV and I was shocked. Like I was absolutely shocked with what, it was just absolute garbage. Like everything was just like trite nonsense. and working in the media you get a sense of how much freedom is actually there and what we actually could be doing you know yeah and it's seeing just i mean even even adults swim in that the capabilities that people have i mean i was i was thinking about liquid i don't know if you remember mtv's liquid television yep yep and then you look at adult swim and uh, like the kind of jarringness is there but the intelligence of liquid television for a large part is lacking you know, I mean, it's it doesn't have the same kind of like cultural intelligence or, you know, cross-cultural intelligence. And, 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 go on. Oh, no, go ahead. Uh, do you think it's intentional, though, or is it following the lowest common denominator? Oh, I think it's just following the money. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's following the money and, uh, you know, all the lessons that were learned, you know, the fact that liquid television could be marketed. I think they just grabbed that as an idea. I mean, that's the other sad thing is working on the back end of media stuff. You get the, 
<laughs> realize that most of the problems are just people following the money and being lazy. You know, so it's but I mean, I was I was talking with uh, Joseph Methane, who uh, he created Ang's Hat, which was one of the first uh, alternate reality games to use the internet and message boards and that to kind of build its legend into the world. Um, and did, he was one of the pioneers of transmedia. And uh, we were just talking about the potentials for what we have as you know creatives, as people just interacting with digital technology and where that potential has gone in the fact that, you know, instead of when, you know, like for instance, magazines, when magazine sales started to go down, the magazine co companies didn't retool their magazines so as a physical product, they were more valuable and then build a digital space that interacted with those physical man uh, magazines. They just ditched the physical magazine and then created a mirror image of the magazine on the web using the most basic functionality. Whereas the web allows for a much more integral experience, you know, but people have basically just taken the physical world, stuck it into digital, and, you know, created the kind of walls that bar that, uh, any kind of transformation outside that. You know, because that, that with media, and I mean, like, with your, you know, with your podcast, you become a media player, you know, and that potential, um, you know, is huge, and everybody has that that ability. You know, to some extent. And what do you what do you think the effects of music becoming more digital are? I mean, do you think that's a good thing, moving away from physical media, or do you think that it's losing something? I think any time that we like, I think any time we make the mistake of thinking that digital is the same as the physical, I think we lose something. I think, you know, I think they both have something to offer. Um, I, I love, I love the ease of digital music and the ability to, you know, uh, manipulate it and change it and how it's really brought high level production tools into people's hands. But I think it also can encourage, like, encourage laziness. You know, I mean, the, interacting with an instrument, um, is way different than, uh, even the, you know, I mean, the, the kind of ideas that you're working with in digital composition or something like that is much different than actually physically learning how to manipulate an instrument and it affects different parts of the brain it affects you know the way we your hand-eye coordination and all that or you know your breath work and that kind of stuff so i think that you know in losing that i think digital takes away from that I, you know not but i think digital has its own you know there's fun you can work with ideas in a much more fluid way in the digital realm you know Right. What what about like CDs and albums versus like MP3s? Mm. Yeah, it's a different experience. I mean, the the tonality in that. I think that uh, whenever you're losing tonality, you lose opportunity. You know, I mean, the if you think of like a choir in a cathedral and the tonality that's possible there, you know, and just the physical interaction with that sound versus an MP3 of that, you know, and then. Right. The, at least the you know the record kind of gives you this physical thing to work with that uh, kind of has its own experience but even the record is uh, a different experience than the choir in the cathedral itself right you know? and I think that uh, you know uh, unfortunately I think a lot of this stuff gets driven by like market conversations you know what I mean like instead of thinking of the mp3 as just another tool for transferring a certain type of sound we think of the mp3 that we buy versus the album that we buy you know what i mean well I, I think i think it also has a different effect on us when we can associate what we're hearing with the imagery that's presented yeah. in like a cd or a record or something like that because having done radio for like 19 years having done a music show for 19 years i don't remember stuff now like i used to like when i when I see an album cover, I can tell you immediately, oh, yeah, that sounded like this or that sounded like that because right. I get overwhelmed with it. But with MP3s, the, that memory just isn't there. It's the, I think it has an effect on the way it, we process because there's nothing else with it. That's a really good point. Yeah, you're right. And even the transfer from albums to CDs because with the album, you had these great, like, you know, album spreads and you can get, like, a full, you know, poster kind of thing going mm -hmm. versus the or even like the album, like etched albums and different, like the art on the album itself, you know, different color vinyl in that versus yeah. the CD. And then, yeah, going to digital, I do, uh, I do some music journalism and you're right. Getting the physical CD sticks in my mind a lot more than getting like a digital download to review. 
Yeah. What, well, uh, one of the things you study is actually audio and its effects on the brain, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, and the binaural. And getting it, getting into it on that level, I mean, that, um, that it's interesting because seeing, seeing exactly what sound can do, um, you start to really appreciate the, the nuances of how you experience sound. Um, one of the, my most recent experiences with that is my friend uh, Kim Cascone is doing these uh, binaural uh, beat compositions. Um, right now he's touring something called Dark Stations in Europe, um, which is uh, kind of an immersive uh, binaural experience that he's designed. And yeah, listen, yeah. listening to his tracks, um, you know, I started to realize because I mean, the, with the binaural stuff, it sounds a lot of it sounds just like hissing, and you know, it, but it's actually affecting your uh, the frequency of your brain. And, you want to explain to people what that is, real quick? Yeah, there's two uh, slightly different tones are played. So you'll you know you'd play like a a fourteen point seven hertz in one ear, and then like fourteen. Uh, point one or something in the other um, and those two tones if properly calibrated will create a third tone in the middle which is kind of a hallucinatory tone and when your brain is processing that and creating that hallucinatory tone it's syncing up to the frequency so you can actually change the frequency um, and different different states you know from sleeping to waking um, and then the meditative in between have different specific frequencies that the brain's operating on so you can start to move the brain into different areas of consciousness um, and what Kim's doing is kind of creating sculptural patterns with that movement um, using the binaural frequencies and then also using uh, he uh, he uses concepts of meditation and uh, hermetic ideas to kind of uh, give the the narrative space to work with those. So, hey, can uh, can you explain what he's doing a little better? Yeah, I mean he's he's creating uh, he's creating visual music in your head. Uh, he's creating he's basically giving you the sound space to meditate and enter into a visionary state. Okay, and does this require headphones, or can he do it in a live setting? In the yeah, and he's doing it in a live setting with the dark stations. He's got a specific speaker array set up, um, hmm. so that the you know sitting at certain points of it, you get the right uh, the right interaction of sounds to to create the mental space. It's real. It's uh, you kind of got to experience it. I mean, it, it, when I would I was listening to his tracks, and I. It, I mean, it took me maybe five to ten times of listening to them to really understand what was going on, because it's it's a different way of listening to music when you're using just the straight binaural, binaural stuff. Um, the Monroe Institute, uh, which was part of the government psychic spy program, actually uh, were one of the pioneer pioneers in using the binaural stuff to create altered states of consciousness, um, and they've they've used it to uh, induce out-of-body experiences um, to try to help uh, the remote viewing state so trying to help clairvoyant states and that um, and done some pretty interesting work with that you know exploring consciousness through these sonic manipulations and there was there was actually a lot of media hype about that for a while where uh you had the media going on about how dangerous these I forget what they were calling them at the time but the the binaural yeah. Uh, tracks and stuff that kids were getting a hold of them and it was <laughs> kids <about> to go <laughs> crazy and all this other stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that was well, I think because they were being marketed for a while as uh, like how to induce an LSD state or something like that. Like, yeah, 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 yeah like, drugs without drugs. Yeah, drugs without drugs. Yeah, it was. Uh, you're right. I'd totally forgotten that. That was there was that brief blip of uh, media hatred towards the binaural stuff, and I'm sure that you know, I mean. They do affect your brain frequency. It does, so it is changing your. It is causing a physical change. So, you know, I can see how that wouldn't be conducive for some people. You know, because it can. I mean, it can. It can. If you go into, if you're conscious and you go into, uh, you know, the the frequency that you'd normally be at when you're dreaming, um, you can start having hallucinations. So, you know, I mean, that could be <laughs> that. 
for certain people, that might not be the best thing for them to be doing, you know. Yeah, well, maybe like hallucinogens, it also depends on the, the environment you're in and what's going on inside your own head. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Do you, do you think it's something that could cause any kind of physical damage to somebody? I don't think physical, but definitely emotional or, or mental, depending on what they experienced in that, you know, in that state. Hmm. Again, I mean, because it... Yeah, I mean, it really... It's it's because you could... I mean, you could arbitrarily slip into a lucid dream, you know? I mean, you could slip into, you know, different states of consciousness that are pretty potent that you wouldn't have been expecting. You know, I mean, if you think of, like, sleep paralysis or something like that, um, those experiences can be pretty unmooring if you're not aware of what they are, you know, right. you're not ready to experience that. So, you know, somebody listening to a, a binaural track that slipped off and then suddenly had sleep paralysis, you know, that could really freak somebody out, you know. Hmm. And what you did something kind of unusual. You said you used to work at a record store and I was reading your, your article about this and you decided that you were going to force yourself to listen to everything. Yeah, I I've been. Uh, I'm sure you're, you're familiar with the movie High Fidelity. Yes. So I mean, working at a record store definitely has that kind of like <laughs> strange, uh, you know, uh, uh, that that arrogance that comes with it. I don't know the the cultural arrogance, but you're getting paid minimum wage, you know, so it's got a bitterness too. <laughs> and uh, I just didn't I didn't like that, and I was getting it because I mean, you just these people come in and they buy the records and. You're, if you're serious about music, you can get offended at the, you know, it just working any kind of retail job, you have that experience where you encounter people that you may not agree with, you know. So I was trying to train myself to be a little bit more uh, friendly on those terms, but also I started to realize how arbitrary music taste was. And so, uh, you know, coming from a background, you know, I was in college at the time and was studying cognitive philosophy, I decided to do an experiment where. Every time, I li every time I was near the radio in the car or whatever, I would randomly turn it to a channel and uh, just listen to it and then kind of train myself to enjoy the music, um, you know, and try to appreciate, find, find things to appreciate. You know, pretty simple experiment, but done over a, a decent period of time. You, uh, you know, you'd asked earlier about how the media it trains us, you know, and that was, that was one of my experiments with that. And I realized just how arbitrary the tastes were. And it also gave me a better sense of, you know, production in that because I could start to listen to things on a more technical level. So it was interesting. It was interesting kind of deconstruction of my normal interaction with music, you know, which I guess has continued through like the binaural stuff and all that. Do you, do you think it had any effect on you outside of just your taste in music? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it definitely, uh, like I said, it, it re, readjusted the way I thought about um, preferences. And, uh, you know, it kind of uh, it gives you a certain freedom in that because you're no longer, I mean, we, we live in such a mediated world. If you start to bombard yourself with that media, you know, and I was kind of going through, there was, uh, I was reading a lot of William S. Burroughs at the time, and he used to turn all the radios onto static. And then, you know, he would sit in this room filled with static and uh, do the cut ups, cutting up newspapers and books and that and just completely reworking the way that he interacted with words and sound and that. So it was kind of coming from that idea. And I think that any time that you start to work with any of your senses in that way and the way that you relate to, um, you know, media or narrative or anything like that, I think that you definitely see broader, broader changes, you know, I mean, because it, it's such a deep integral thing. I mean, like preference just sort of, you start to realize the arbitrariness of preference on all levels, I guess is the easiest way to say it. Okay. The, the other thing that, that interests me about sound before we move on from this is the, the, that more and more researchers are finding that ancient sites have these mind altering acoustics to them. Yeah. The archaeo acoustic stuff is yeah. incredible. Yeah. That is, that's an awesome, uh, Paul Devereux is doing a project right now on that, where he's, they're going to the megalithic sites in Britain, hmm. and uh, they're trying to play the stones and seeing what frequencies they ring at, and that. Um, and then there's other stuff where the uh, yeah the sound dynamics and acoustic dynamics of some of these temples are amazing. And then uh, it, again, it goes back to the well. The in that I think infrasound. Uh, 
plays more of a role, but the ability for certain structures to, uh, you know, uh, help infrasound to uh, magnify, you know, which definitely has a physical effect and can cause altered states of consciousness as well. So the, I don't, for me, I mean, it's just, it's beautiful to think of a time when there were vocal people trained to sing specific vocal tones in specific patterns in these temple structures, which were built on specific mathematical ratios and, you know, uh, narrative ratios and this whole mythopoetic structure. And then to be, you know, to think of yourself in that environment, fully, you know, active at what its potential was. That's amazing. You know, I mean, you think of those Gothic cathedrals and that. Yeah. yeah. That's fascinating. Or even the Great Pyramid. Exactly. Yeah, and that, you know, and that probably a very personal experience, you know, that, are, that yeah. Well, I was, I was talking to Gary Evans uh, a few weeks ago, and he, uh, he actually had us play a clip that he recorded in there, and just, he said the experiences that you get in there when you're intoning certain sounds is just amazing like it's completely mind altering right yeah see that's amazing and that that kind of stuff that's where um I, we've got all these digital tools <clears throat> you know we've got these we've got like stuff like burning man where people pour tons of money into these like art projects that you know it's a fun party or something i don't know but these these ideas like the fact that that pyramid chamber is able to be built that technology is there We've got people doing binaural stuff. You know, that's what it, that's what kind of excites me right now and frustrates me, is that there's all this potential. We look back at the pyramids. Well, we could be doing that. You know, and we could. You get like people makers that do electronic projects. You know, very easily we could be doing that kind of stuff. But it, like I said before, you know, stuff like the magazines. We have a bunch of digital magazines, but we don't have anybody really creating those transmedia experiences that go to the level of in incorporating something like the, you know, the pyramid dynamics into a sound event, you know, which wouldn't be that hard to do. And it, and it also makes us wonder just exactly what the technology was those people understood that we are just now maybe getting to the very tip of. It's Well, it's amazing when the, the sacred geometry webinar that I did was really interesting because it pointed out that it seems to be more than complex technology. It was simple understandings of basic ratios that they had that we've over complexified and over narrated and turned into way more than is necessary to understand these things. You know, because if you think of the pyramid, it's going on basic geometry, you know, and the resonances of those basic geometric forms. So from that, well, but it's still even in order to keep it simple they had to understand that right but that's but that's a, i mean that's a very basic simple understanding you know i think that you know the mystery is almost uh it's mystified the simple you know hmm. okay all right we're going to take a quick 45 second break we'll be back in uh well 45 seconds with david metcalf The opinions expressed by the host and guests on Where Did the Road Go are their own and do not represent those of WVBR or its management. Join us on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com where you can send us questions for our live guests via email or the live chat room. You can also check out our upcoming schedule, blog, link section, book reviews, videos, and links to our Twitter, Facebook, iTunes, and much more. That's wheredidtheroadgo.com. And tonight on Where Did the Road Go, we've been talking to David Metcalf and uh, going kind of all over the place. Uh, and you said you do articles for a reality sandwich and um, what's the grail one? Uh, the Daily Grail. Daily Grail, yes. That's, and that's, go on. that's Greg Taylor's uh, web magazine that deals with uh, high weirdness and uh, Fortiana. Right. And uh, what's the eyeless owl? That was a the digital project that started out as me just kind of scrawling pictures and posting them up. Um, where I was, it was an experiment in kind of immediate art and uh, cut-ups that eventually turned into a gallery-based uh, kind of uh, immersive animation project that then turned into a consciousness-focused uh, web magazine entity kind of thing. 
it's real wow. amorphous. Yeah, it's 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 more of just a. It, it's basically it's an experiment in just the digital space and you know experimenting with information in the digital space. Right now, it's it's pretty much just your basic web magazine with articles and that kind of stuff. But um, it has been more in the past. Okay, and you also write for disinformation. Yeah, I write. I write occasionally there. Um, you know, that's one of the things that's that's interesting right now is that if you're if you're active in any of these areas in writing or any kind of creative area, there's a lot of different uh, formats to get your work out and to engage, you know, in conversation in that. So I kind of look at each of these different web spaces as a way to uh, present ideas differently, and I get to deal with different ideas at each one. So. Okay. Now, what do you think about the proliferation of these paranormal shows on television, these reality shows, whether it be ghost hunters or chasing UFOs or whatever? I don't. I don't have a high. <laughs> I don't have a high regard of them. Um, the my experience dealing with the actual parapsychological research, I don't. I don't even know what the what those shows are doing. I, mean, I guess it's it's kind of like. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Wait, I used to do it. I used to go to to graveyards in in high school at like midnight. You know, what? I don't know. It doesn't have. They're they're not really doing any serious research. I, one of the things that uh, there's a a parapsychologist Lloyd Orbach mm -hmm. who made a a very good point in that if these people were serious, we could be getting some great you know actual research done. But they're not, and the amount of money that's poured into them is really a waste when there is potential research to be done, you know, and not just turn it into some kind of weird uh, reality TV show circus, you know. But the thing is, if they did actual research, would they have viewers like they do now? I, you know, I think you could transmedia it. I think it again goes back to the, you know, the kind of potential for digital technology and, and transmedia ideas to make these things fun, you know. I think they could. They would have to. They would have to rethink the thing. It wouldn't be easy. You couldn't just do like a, rea a cut and paste template reality show, you know. But I, I do think that the people doing them think they're doing serious work. I mean, that they do come across that way. I hope not. I, do, I, I, mean, <laughs> I hope they don't honestly think that. I mean, I, they may. I don't know what. Uh, I don't know though. I highly doubt that. Well, I guess you're right. Yeah, that's hard. That's, that's their performance does go pretty deep. Well, it seems like they're actually looking for evidence. It's just not evidence of, you know, no matter what they capture, it's not telling us anything we don't already know. Right. Yeah. And well, and also the the kind of the the overlay that they put on it with like different terms and ideas of what things could be, mm -hmm. uh, is kind of a disservice to the research as well. You know. Because I mean, I will in parapsychology, they they go to great pains to uh, to make it very scientific. So when you're when you're dealing with anything that you don't know what it is, you don't like toss a folklore term on top of it and say that you're dealing with that, you know? Right. Like with right. with poltergeist phenomenon, the idea, you know, in the the folklore of it was that it was either a devil or a ghost or a demon or something like that that was. Uh, you know, spirit of the dead coming back for revenge or, you know, something like that. But when they actually got into the physical research of it, it most likely looks like it's caused by, you know, people and there some sort of interaction between a person and the environment. Um, and by people, you don't mean hoaxers necessarily, right. but yeah, no, some, psi. Yes, some sort of, some sort of uh, psychical interaction between the person and the environment, you know. And then that's, that's a complete much different thing but even there you've got to be careful with saying what it is because really all you can empirically see is that you have a person that these phenomena occur around and then kind of test the person's psychological state to see if that has some correlations you know test correlations between the person and the environment and it's a real careful process so when you get like a ghost tv show investigator going in and suddenly it's a demon and you know i don't know it just yeah well, I, as soon as you label it, you also kind of exclude so many other possibilities that you just don't even look at the evidence for after that point. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think you see the same thing in the UFO phenomenon when people get absolutely certain that these things are extraterrestrial and they just 
not even intentionally, but they seem to just not even acknowledge the stuff that points against those ideas. Right. Yeah. And that's, and I, it's, I think the UFO thing, and that's, that's an interesting thing with all of this stuff is because with the UFO phenomena, outside of the extraterrestrial myth, and I'm using that term, you know, as actual, it is a, it is some sort of myth, you know, not in, or, or you know, it's not bad that it's a myth, but it's a, you know, it's a story narrative over this physical phenomena. Um, with that, you miss so much of what, uh, how little is there, you know, and I don't, I mean, there's, there's physical, you've got physical evidence, you've got people having these, you know, sightings of things in the sky, and then some interaction that goes farther than that. Um, but when you really put it all together, there's not much there to actually have, to actually hold up this narrative of the ET stuff. And right. I think there's, there's a much deeper question there, which is really interesting because you get people have an interaction with UFO and suddenly they have uh, psi experiences, you know, or somebody yeah. encounters a Bigfoot or something and then they encounter a UFO and then have psi experiences and suddenly they're clairvoyant, you know, so many weird kind of anecdotes that come out that don't really fit into anybody's uh, pigeonhole box. And that's where, I, I think that's where it really gets exciting, you know. And that's well, that's kind of why you said like it would. That's where I question if it if it would ruin it if people actually you know tried to create media around the real science because I think the real scientific questions um, are really interesting. Yeah, I mean they're they're much more interesting than uh, just kind of uh, just ghost stuff. You know, like ghost hunting. I, I even wonder, I mean, when you look at, like, the DMT research and the similarities between, like, ayahuasca states, DMT states, and UFO encounters, your death experiences, I mean, a lot of it points toward some kind of altered state, but I mean, the physical evidence. And sometimes I wonder if the lights themselves are just a sign of an area that is maybe something that sets off DM, you know, DMT naturally in our, in our system or something that changes our state of consciousness and the light is just an after effect of that after effect of that state in that area, you know what I mean? Right, yeah, that, Paul Devereaux uh, did a lot of research on that with a thing called yes. Dragon Trust. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, exactly. And I think that you can, that's, that's something I think, I don't know if Randall talked about that when Randall Carlson was on. No, no, I didn't. But that's something that Randall is, is deeply interested in the way that, uh, you know, geomagnetic and geology uh, affects consciousness. Um, you know, different uh, kind of, you know, uh, the, the earth lights idea and that kind of thing. Well, when I, when I read uh, Devereaux's early work, it just kind of blew me away that the correlation between UFO sightings and, uh, like, different... Uh, Default lines and stuff like that were like dead on. Right. You know? It seemed like something you couldn't just ignore. Right. And that, have you read uh, Project Identification? No, I haven't. Yeah, University of Missouri uh, physicist. Uh, you think he was the head of? It may be University of Southern Missouri. I'm not quite sure. Um, but he was the head of the physics department, and they did a multi-year study of a local UFO um, kind of spree. And they found that, uh, yeah, they found heavy correlations between uh, what appeared to be just some form of, like, plasma that was, uh, like, a, you know, uh, electromagnetic plasma that was, you know, being generated naturally that seemed to have some kind of, like, uh, psychoactive properties where, you know, when you thought something, it would react to it. Um, but from what I've seen, that the project identification work has never, it doesn't get much right up in the UFO lore, and uh, but at the same time has never really been discredited scientifically. Well, that's, so, that's, so. that's very similar to Andrew Collins' uh, latest work, uh, Light Quest, and the yeah, he about plasma and stuff. Yep, he mentions, uh, that's actually where I heard about the project identification book. Really? Yeah, it was, uh, he mentions it early on in the book. And I was like, what is this? I've never even heard of this. You know, and then I looked it up, and yeah, it, the book is very interesting. Oh, I'm going to have to check that out myself. Uh, I actually missed I've read the book, but I must have missed that. Um, so, I mean, you, the, the UFO thing kind of, I mean, it, our consciousness is intimately involved in this. 
Right. I, I would, I mean, well, it, that's, you know, going back to the alchemical ideas and that, you know, I mean, I think so. I mean, anything, I think we've, we've lost sight of exactly how integrated we are with the, the, you know, reality as a whole, you know? And so yeah. when you look at, when you look at something like UFOs or, you know, Psy or anything like that, you start to touch on that kind of integral wholeness because it does start to penetrate every aspect from physical to mental to, you know, and, and, the, and the fact that people will have psychic experiences after UFO encounters or after near-death experiences, again, kind of connects all these things together. Right. Right. It's like some aspect of reality we just don't understand or something in the way that reality works and interacts with us that we don't understand. Right. And, then, and also, I mean, if you look at in, in the past, these things have been more integrally tied together. You know the idea of uh, of initiatory experience that involves a kind of like induction of a near death experience. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, uh, which then would lead to the assumption that you would develop some kind of psychism and uh, would have interactions with entities. You know, and so these things in the past have been very intimately tied, and it's it really only recently, you know, within like the twentieth century that we've had a really demarcated difference. In the way we think of this stuff, you know. Well, yeah, and I, and I think that that comes down to our need to to label things, to kind of separate them out, put them in separate boxes, and you know uh, that that sort of breaking everything down to understand it sort of concept. Yeah, I think that that's very true because I think if it kind of comes out of the progress of science, you know, like or science in a materialistic sense, you know, right. techno I guess technology and the progress of technology we've developed a mindset that really starts to separate things out, whereas in the past that wasn't the case. I mean, look at like somebody like Tesla, who's working with Edison and getting inspiration from, you know, uh, Goethe's poetry, you know. Mm, yeah. And, and that's how he's coming up with his ideas and still creating functionally, uh, you know, functionally relevant ideas in a physical science, but getting inspiration from Goethe's poetry, you know. Mm. Well, tes Tesla was kind of unique, it seems, too. Sort of, but if you look at, like, Swedenborg, Swedenborg was a material scientist. You look at, and, you know, your Pythagoras created war machines. You know, all that is uh, kind of, you know, mystic as Pythagorean philosophy can get. He was also creating very practical machines. Oh, yeah, no, but I mean, the, the way Tesla was able to use his mind was very unique. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I guess Pythagoras wasn't necessarily creating uh, Tesla coils or, uh, you know. Tesla was clearly years, if not centuries, ahead of his time as far as we're going. <laughs> yeah. As we start to slip backwards into <laughs> exactly. the world of advertising. I was driving into Atlanta. It's amazing to me that people don't recognize, I mean, it looks like, it kind of looks like Blade Runner, like driving into any major city now, you know, with like moving billboards and that. Yeah, but in in Blade Runner it was a critique, and somewhere along the lines we've gotten this idea that it was like aesthetically pleasing. I, I find it so interesting. You know what I mean? It's so interesting yeah. to see that and be like, no, this was a critique. Like this, it looked cool on film, but it was a critique. Like it wasn't, it wasn't an encouragement to make you know automated uh, strange you know video words stretch across. Still, you're still there. You kind of digitized out. Yep, oh, I'm still here. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Our, our culture seems to get more and more inundated with everything has to be about profit and commercialism and consumerism and nothing else. Right. And that's that's obviously not healthy. And it's also, I think, that, you know, the all these ideas, you know, the parapsychology and all of that, like the one of the main problems with uh, parapsychology and its decline was they never found a way to monetize it. There's a great report from Sony during their ESP experiments um, where they came back with, yes, it's real, uh, but we can't figure out how to make money out, off of it, so we're going to drop the research. Who did this? Sony? Yeah, Sony. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, there's, it's, you know, and that kind of sums it up for a lot of the, you know, the weird stuff. It's not monetizable. Now... As you just said there, they did the research, they came away with, yes, it's real. 
you you all have skeptics who will under no circumstances ever admit that any scientific evidence can prove psi and that's simply not the case is it yeah no i mean that's i don't even know what's going on there i that that to me is like the biggest reality like hole that i don't i just can't ever cross because i read that too i'm like what are you talking what are you talking about i i just i don't even get that i mean there's so many studies there's so many studies there's personal experience it's yeah when they say there's no evidence and that's especially with the remote viewing stuff i've seen you know article after article saying that there's no evidence for remote viewing whatsoever well there's actually quite a number of declassified documents that you can look at that show pretty good evidence you know including and that's including non stuff that wasn't classified at the time that were uh, replications from universities now there's the Dean Radin's compiled uh, some of the lists on you know the amount of research that actually has been done and it's insane you know I just, it's amazing to me that people say that there's no evidence whatsoever uh, and I think the wrong, I think skeptic is the wrong word because skeptics question things they're not questioning things they're absolutely certain right. that there's no there's no evidence they're they're you know they're true believers in that sort of materialism of reality right and well and also I think too saying that there's no evidence uh, states that it kind of it uh, I think it falls into creating a false idea of what there ever was evidence for because most of that research, you know, they don't make a claim for knowing a mechanism for what happened. Um, all the research shows is that there's something going on that we that doesn't have a, an easy explanation right now. There's anomalous information transfer, you know, or there's anomalous, uh, you know, physical interaction. And uh, it, it is for the, the way that a lot of the kind of debunking skepticism goes at it is they use the term magic or, you know, that, you know, I don't believe in magic and therefore this blah, blah, blah. That's not what parapsychology is looking at. It's looking at anomalous information transfer and anomalous physical interaction with the environment. And when you have those things happening, it investigates that. And there are certain cases where uh, there's no easy explanation for how that stuff can happen, you know. Yeah. Especially when you get into the other thing, too, I think that's kind of a misnomer. The, the reason that the military stuff worked was because they went, they tested to see, okay, um, we're going to take 200 people. Can they do, can they do these anomalous information transfer tasks? Okay, of those who can, uh, which ones are better? We're going to train those up and keep working with them. The way that the parapsychology as a science does it is they take just whoever, you know, a wide swath of the populace and then test to see if there's anomalous information transfer. Well, those are two different things. You know, it's like an Olympic athlete is going to outperform most of your high school teams. Right. You know what I mean? And so you can get as many high school teams together as you want. You may not produce an Olympic athlete, but that doesn't mean the Olympic athlete doesn't exist. You know, and so it's kind of, it's, it's a strange, it, you know, a lot of times they can pull out the the public stuff and say, well, look, we've tested this many people and it's such a small, you know, such a small effect that that's nothing. Whereas the military were able to train guys that can do it fairly regularly and it's pretty impressive. It's not, you know, it's not just uh, a small p-value on its stats. And, and, it, and it seems that small value is not, you know, people will write it off, oh, it's only, you know, 5% above average, but that 5% is significant. Right. Right, especially when you're dealing with the questions that are raised in, in the psychical research, which are, you know, very significant for what exactly is our mind if our ideas are starting to have effects on the world or, you know, the, the way that we get information to memory doesn't necessarily have a time component to it or a space component. You know, that's one of the things Russell Targ is really um, big on is that remote viewing uh, demonstrates a type of consciousness that goes beyond time and space you know are you aware of dr shock's work on uh robert shock's work on uh psi yeah i i have his book and we, we discussed it a little bit i'm not familiar uh not familiar as much with his own theories on it well he uh just him pointing out that the better psychic uh results come about when solar activity is higher oh yeah right yeah 
That's well. There's some interesting. There's some interesting research with that. Uh, there's also seems to be a correlation with sidereal time as well. Really? So universal time when uh, the Earth, depending on where it's at uh, in relation to the galactic center, seems to have an effect. I know that there was some controversy over that, but yeah, there's there's different correlations that seem to affect it. Uh, Joe McMonagall was at the Rhine Center recently for a, a seminar. And he was talking about that, and he said that um, although that may have an effect overall for somebody like him, um, it, at least in his experience, it, it it doesn't really matter. You know, he can he can do what he can do at that time, irregardless of any of those factors, um, equally as well as he can when those factors are in play. Right, so, but I, th- I think shocks shocks point was that this would have to be the grandest hoax in history for people to get better results at certain times at the same times. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. You know, for, for that pattern to emerge, there has to be some legitimacy, legitimacy to the work. Right. That's an interesting point. Yeah, that is. Yeah. Right. Well, let's, let, let's dip into liminality here while we still have some time. Now you have a whole website set up around this. Yeah. Liminal analytics. Um, trying to actually George Hansen's ideas play into that too basically trying to um, create an amorphous organization that can touch on and deal with liminality without getting burned by it (laughs) (laughs) you want to try and explain liminality a little bit to people Uh, the liminal is the the border state so liminality is when you're crossing a threshold of some sort you know it deals with changes in state so the the liminal the liminal line between fall and winter you know or some of the changing of the seasons you each you know from go well from going for, to summer to winter you have fall fall would be the liminal state and if you think of traditional cultures it's usually within the liminal points whether it's you know going through puberty or a seasonal change or uh, a change in galactic alignment or something where they have their festivals and where you have the things that they're supposed to be courting uh, these states of consciousness that evoke change. So, and, and psychic abilities and paranormal stuff tends to happen more toward the liminal. Right. Isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And that, you know, it's interesting in uh, the, I was going to a gas, I was driving and uh, I got worried about my oil. And so I stopped at a gas station that I never normally would stop at. It was like a kind of rundown gas station, um, more like a lotto, <laughs> you know, like more like a lotto uh, place to right. buy lotto tickets than anything else, you know. And I normally wouldn't have like stopped there, but my oil light was low, so I went in. And uh, as I was buying the oil, I noticed that they had a bunch of hoodoo uh, like uh, gambling books at the counter. And I'd been looking for that stuff like in every gas station all over, like as I travel. And it wasn't until my oil was low, like I kind of was like, eh, I guess I'll stop here. And went in that I found the hoodoo stuff. But again, it was something that I normally would have passed up. So it's it's things like that, you know, the liminal are usually, it's that, that crossing point, you know, where you have uh, gambling, you know, danger alleyways, you know what I mean? And that's, that's kind of one of the things that... Uh, in psychism, you know, in psychical research, uh, a lot of times you have uh, psychic events attend uh, mental imbalance, you know, for something like that. So you have to be ready when you're dealing with this stuff to not only be dealing with maybe some interesting phenomena, but also the physical realities of mental illness, uh, you know, physical danger. And that kind of thing. If you're actually going to investigate it, you know, Wade, Dave, uh, Wade Davis is a good example who wrote *Serpent in the Rainbow* with Voodoo. Um, mm-hmm. He's got some of the best uh, ethnographic information on Voodoo, and almost got poisoned, killed. You know, he was in the midst of a fascist regime in, in uh, Haiti. You know, right. So. right. Huh. But what? So, do you think it's an effect of our consciousness that? draws the paranormal into these liminal places or is it something about the paranormal i think it's the the liminal place is the place where your categories break down um categories are still on they're undefined at that point 
and so it allows for a lot more uh, kind of transgressive and uh, change-oriented experiences. Hmm. You know, you don't really have a strong category. Once you're in the liminal state, you're starting to transfer categories. You're, tar- you know, you're starting to transfer uh, forms and, and that kind of thing. So I think it allows an openness where we can experience the stuff that we normally wouldn't experience. So, like when people say, you know, uh, ghosts will haunt houses that are, when, when they're making a lot of changes to them. Uh, you know, old houses get uh, reconstruction and stuff, and then suddenly they have haunting phenomena. And, of course, they blame it on the ghosts who lived there before being upset the house is being changed. But it's really uh, because it's in a liminal state. Right. Yeah, I think that that would be a good way to look at it. Yeah, I think that, you know... Um yeah, it's the, the change in state like that. I think that's a good example because that also show you know, talking about the way that the our expectations control our, our narrative. You know what I mean? The expectation that I'm disrupting the house and therefore the ghost is angry, you know, or whatever, versus the idea that in any situation where you're making those kind of changes, you're going to have these uh, phenomena that occur, you know, which is, is a large part of what George Hansen's uh, research and books, you know, or his book points out is the fact that um, this phenomena that we see that we're trying to label and that we're trying to say is psychism or it's a UFO or whatever seems to be more socially or, you know, more of a, a social phenomena or a way to describe a physical phenomena that occurs during these changes in states and these liminal times, you know, and his, his, the idea of the liminal analytics as an organization, he pointed out how any organization that tries to create a hierarchy and uh, address these things usually collapses. And he uses the, the current state of parapsychology as an example of that, where you know there was a lot of funding for a certain period of time, but now it's gone back to kind of the liminal. You know, it's gone back to being kind of on the fringes. You know, so how do you? How do you theorize around that an organization that can tackle that kind of liminality but still stay in existence? Well, it would have. It would seem like it would have to continually change. Exactly, and that's where the eyeless owl. That's why it was really hard for me to kind of describe what the eyeless owl is, because it was my first kind of experiment in that idea. You know, because the digital space is a very liminal space, and so you're able to do a lot of things in the digital space that. Uh, benefit from that kind of fluidity you know and how does the trickster play into all of this trickster phenomena in general i think the trickster is a good way to describe the way that people interact with those changes in state you know the 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 fear that's evoked by uh the changing categories by the uncertainty of that you know and then um the trickster is kind of the the character that uh, how is it, you know, that encapsulates that experience, you know, a way of personifying that experience. Which, yeah. You know, I mean, if you think about, like, the folk tales about encountering the devil at the crossroads and stuff like that, again, you've got a liminal state, you've got a place where you've got the cross, you know, where the, the threshold between real and unreal, between, you know, the different roads and that, it's all interconnected there and there the devil is to either you know you play him in cards or dice or a guitar or whatever and you either win or you lose you know but there's a change in state there but there's also that danger you know and, and it seems like the trickster in general seems rife throughout ufo experiences like the the way they'll lead people on like john keel of course was, was great at kind of telling these stories of what happened to people and how they were led in one direction only to be have kind of like the rug pulled out from underneath them. And and he himself embodying the trickster, you know, I mean, that, and that's that's one of the interesting things that you see in this this stuff is, you know, like Keel was a storyteller. Right. So even in his descriptions of what people were happening, he was he was taking the real information, processing it through his, you know, you know, sometimes hoaxing, sometimes not, you know, kind of narrative and creating this story around it that was true, but not in the way that we like to think of truth, you know? Hmm. Interesting way to put it. So do you, do you think that was an intentional thing on his part? Uh, yes and no. 
I don't think, you know, I think once you get to the level of somebody like Keel, uh, the intentionality, you know, is there, but I think there's also a level of uh, unintentional because he suffered consequences from it too, you know. He, it, you know, he towards the end of his life was, was battling with the, the ghosts of the, the world he'd created, you know, so. And what, what what do you think drive phenomena like that, like the trickster, like when it manifests as a paranormal entity, you know, the ghosts who try to lure people away and things like that? I don't know. I think it's it, I think it has a very integral place with the way the the world changes. You know, I think that they're they're kind of like heralds of change in some in some way. You know, so like a reflection of our deep conscious, perhaps. I don't know. I, I, it has a very physical aspect to it too. So I'm not. I don't know. You know, it, once you get into that question of like a reflection of our unconscious, like what does that mean for physical reality? You know, <laughs> that, you know what I mean? Because that like you're suddenly like your your inner outer uh, uh, alignment there becomes flipped. You know, where the the deep inner is becoming the outer, coming at you from outer space. It gets a little bit weird. You know. Uh, you're on WVBR FM Ithaca. This is Where Did the Road Go? We've been talking to David Metcalf. And are you familiar at all with uh, Patrick Harper? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love his work. Yeah. I, I, I just talked to him about all this stuff, and I, I thought his idea of demonic reality is really compelling to explain the paranormal. Oh, it's fascinating. Yeah. He, he enjoys alchemy as well. I think he's more Jungian with it, but. Yes. Yes, um, he is. Yeah. He, yeah. His ideas are fascinating. And Jeffrey uh, Kripal as well from Rice University um, has some really interesting ideas about this kind of narrative uh, demonic reality sort of uh, thing. And, and I think in the end, the more we study this, the, the solution to whether it be UFOs or the paranormal, or whatever, is going to be a redefinition of what we constitute as reality. Definitely. And I think it'll be a more, more integral uh, reality experience, you know, and I, I, I don't think that I think the the issues you know with, with truth claims and that kind of stuff there's so much room here where you know especially like in harper's work or kripal where they're able to deal with these things outside of the black and white proof claims mm -hmm. and i think that that's really the way to go about it and that because i think there's something really uh integral and personal to learn with this stuff you know uh, that i think it's mixed like mixed up and kind of muddled when it's too too based on, uh, you know, trying to prove that somebody's giving birth to a hybrid or something, you know. Right, right, right. Well, it, it seems like our consciousness, consciousness probably plays a larger part in the reality we perceive than most people are aware. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, you got you got all these these new age movements where you know you have the, like the law of attraction stuff. Where oh, think positive thoughts and think you know, and this stuff will come to you, and it, and that might be a little bit on the flaky side, but there might be something underneath it there that and, isn't. And that that those ideas like the secret and that is interesting because the secret comes out of uh, hermeticism, right? You know, and they they I think they kind of goofily showed that in the secret movie where you've got that beginning and it's like a Knights Templar or something has a scroll and from an Egyptian priest or there's some kind of like mm. isn't there some sort of I don't know if you saw the secret movie. I, I haven't seen it there's some sort of like uh, dramatization at the beginning where they like imply that but if you actually look at where those ideas came from in the new thought movement um, somebody like William Walker Atkinson was very active in practical occultism and hermeticism while at the same time writing new thought and uh, you know, positive thinking and mind science stuff that would eventually become the secret. You know, so uh, what's dumbed down in the secret actually goes back to some pretty potent ways to work with consciousness and to uh, kind of experience consciousness in relation to the world. I, I always liked the way that uh, Seth and Jane Roberts expressed it. Uh, that's one thing. You know, I'm interested in the channeling stuff, but I have not read any of the Seth. Ones. I've never, I was never that interested in the channeling stuff, and I, I had bought a book. I had bought Seth Speaks just on a whim, figuring, well, maybe it would be good you know, entertainment at some point, and had been doing some near-death research online and kept seeing references to Seth, and only Seth. And I kept going, why is this one channeled ent just entity quoted so much? Sat down, read the book, was stunned at how like specific and detailed it was. Right. 
because my problem with channeling was always that it's always so vague. You can interpret it a million different ways. It's right. not actually in any kind of detail, but this was. Right. Yeah, some of the better, there's some really interesting, uh, the, the channeling stuff is fascinating. Like, I don't know, because you get that. Like, there's that weird, like, there's a level to it where it is very vague and, like, kind of goofy. But then you get those other things where, you know, like you're saying with the Seth stuff, where it's much more specific and, uh, and interesting. And, and I always liked the fact that Jane Roberts was always skeptical of it herself. Right. right. <laughs> Which added just sort of another element to the whole thing. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm going to have to go back and look at Seth now. Have to see. But he also, you know, talked about how, re, you know, how our consciousness, how our being reflects and, in, in, you know, interacts with reality in ways that we don't understand. Right. And th that seems to be the thing that we really need to... I think we need to understand that as a whole before we can make any major moves forward. Yeah, and that's the thing. I mean, that it's the very basic, like, I mean, it's the basic level that we start at. You know, we start with our consciousness. So oh, yeah. to not to not have a clear grasp of that, to think that we can go, you know, I think one of the biggest things is something like transhumanism, where it assumes that everything about the consciousness is going to be solved through artificial intelligence, and then we're just going to move on to machines. When we haven't even gotten a basic grasp over, you know, our own reality as, as humans, we're already thinking that the next step is going to happen and it's going to be a human-created machine, you know, that holds consciousness. Like, that that seems to be missing out on quite a bit, you know. And, and since we don't understand consciousness, it's it's kind of, you know, it seems like if we did, we could make intelligent machines. The fact that we can't is because we don't understand what right. consciousness is. right. Yet at the same time, we can see reflections of consciousness in everything. Right. You know, so it's it's such a fleeting sort of thing. And I, but I also think the way that science demotes consciousness to be just a side effect of matter is where we're we're failing. Yeah. Well, it's it's you know the I think that's the only way that certain views of science can deal with it. You know, unfortunately, because they can't give space to uh you know the weirdness of consciousness it's, yeah you know it does get it's you know it's stuff like the the abduction questions or the channeling or any of those experiences where the re the physical reality of it is unclear the emotional reality of it is pretty clear you know but so how does you know how does science deal with that as an empirical question and it's much more comfortable just to dismiss it um you know dismiss consciousness as some sort of epiphenomena and, you know, move on to dealing with more physical stuff. Yeah. And, and the rare times you get someone who tries to deal with it, like a John Mack, he gets viciously attacked for it. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, I mean, that, and that, that too is the, the fact that in order to research that stuff, you know, and that's the thing, that's the, another aspect that, that Hansen has pointed out, is that, or, and I, you know, uh, many people have experienced is that when you start to deal with these topics and you try to do it seriously you've got the ghost hunting stuff on the one hand or you know any of the any of that genre of things and then you on the other hand you have uh really bleeding edge research but in the middle ground you have all this risk and unless you get on the bleeding edge research which at the time you know the psychic spy program was bleeding edge research you know, they were there in Silicon Valley, you know, in the Palo Alto area and that doing uh, high level, you know, uh, research in that. But so it didn't have the same kind of risks, you know, but trying to come at it just on a, a regular level. John Matt coming out of Harvard, you know, he's at huge risk and was and faced it when he went on. They had that tribunal against him, you know, yeah. to, to even discuss these topics as anything but, you know silliness that shouldn't be discussed you know kenneth, kenneth ring seems like he got away with it a little bit better yeah yeah it depends it's, it's interesting to see like who gets knocked and who doesn't you know yeah yeah because i mean like but and then it's also too i mean there's there's some things yeah this is it's a weird it's really strange i see it because i i you know writing about it i do the sign the news for a reality sandwich so that's something that i monitor is the way that parapsychology and these, the uh, the stranger ends of consciousness studies get covered in the media, you know, and you have something like Ibn Alexander with his uh, the near death experience book, and right. he had the bestseller that got a lot of controversy around 
However, there was a woman who wrote a near-death experience, and I believe she was a neuroscientist as well, a couple months before his book came out, and it became a New York Times bestseller too, but you never saw her in the media, and you never, she was never uh, critiqued or ripped apart or anything. But Alexander, uh, you know, kind of became the the uh, poster child to attack, you know, the, the straw man to attack, so. Mm. And why do you think that is? I don't know. I think, it, I, I, in some ways, I think it, Alexander, uh, his marketing team probably pushed it too hard. So <laughs> you're going to get that recoil, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, and also uh, may have courted the controversy to up sales, too, you know? So. Well, yeah, that... that does happen as marketing seems to infiltrate everything yeah exactly yeah and then you get, and that's that's the thing too is you get something as like a near-death experience which you don't get much more personal than that and then you've got a marketing team i mean because his uh his original title for the book was um something like a uh i forget an end of one or something like that it had something to do with his place as an experiment where the the variable was himself or something ah. and uh, that was his original title and then they wanted to change it into you know include heaven and all that stuff to make it sell so you think about the effect that that book has on the cultural consciousness if he had written it from his original title versus the bringing in heaven into the equation right totally different completely different and that was even the newsweek story he didn't choose that his publisher did so his publisher gave them a very heaven oriented christianized section from the book that uh changed the way that his experience was expressed you know and so and then when you get the people doing interviews they get the press kit from the publisher which is heaven oriented and all that and he's discovered the truth christian message and all that stuff so you know, then the people interviewing him are coming from a skewed version of what he originally was writing the book under. You know, all tied to marketing and decisions by the publishers who wanted to sell more books. And whereas selling books obviously is important when it when it affects the message that's being sent out there, it, it becomes an issue. Yeah, exactly. Especially because I mean, you're dealing with you're no longer dealing with like the history of, uh, you know, like a rock band or something like that. You're dealing with a near-death experience. This is a question. Like, what is that? You know, this is a very important question. Now we have a neuroscientist who's had what he claims is a near-death experience. What does that mean for culture? Like, oh, let's toss heaven on it and make it, you know, make it a book about that so we can sell it to the, you know, like midline Christians that have questions about their faith. And, like, and there's, a, there's also like the, uh, the size study that was done in Cornell where it, they actually came up with some solid data pointing to Psy, but the way it was treated in the media, I mean, it wasn't dismissed in the media, but it was kind of expressed very differently from what the research really was. Exactly, yeah, and then they also had the fact that uh, the way the media treated it was that Bem's study was the study, that suddenly there was a study that proved ESP and it was this one, where in reality, Bem was doing a replication then he, right. just, he was working with, you know, decades of prior research. So it wasn't, you know, the way the media portrayed it as this one-off uh, study. It was actually a study in a series of studies that were multiple researchers working with an idea of what was going on, you know. And so it's, and it, it's frustrating because it's things like, uh, you know, discovery science and stuff like that that do these really poor portrayals, just these really cheap, just bad, 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 bad reporting. It's terrible <laughs> journalism. It really is. And that, you know, just um, under the label of discovery science, you know, I just, well, at the same time, they have UFO shows. So it's like, you know, they, they badly report the skepticism and they badly report the phenomena as well. Yeah, I so. mean, it doesn't seem like there really is much actual journalism left anymore. No, no, I was, I, I was, uh, uh, the, this was now we're really jumping topics, but the Chelsea Wolf. Um, I don't know if you've heard any of her music. No. Um, she's a she's an independent artist right now, and uh, I'm going to be reviewing her new album for Alarm Magazine, um, which is a Chicago-based music magazine. And I was looking at some of the other writing on it, and I was just like, oh man, P 
people can't be <laughs> like people. And I'm not saying my writing's you know like top of the top of the line in you know, but just the reading it and thinking about what music criticism at one time was, you know, or cultural writing and that, and reading what the current oh, it's horrible. Journalism is is bad art, it seems. J- j- journalism seems to be now repeating of talking points and press releases. Yeah, and then or you know like personal experiences that have nothing to do with uh, the actual piece of art itself. Yeah, I wrote a, a well, Kim Cascone recently did a thing called Seventy Years of Sunshine, which was uh, he did a Fifty Years of Sunshine, uh, you know, a while ago that was looking at the fiftieth anniversary of the discovery of LSD and 70 years of sunshine was kind of like a second compilation music compilation for the 70th anniversary of the discovery of LSD and I don't I think there were three reviews of it that started out with I don't like drugs (laughs) and I mean that that was where they took the review from for an album that was supposed to bring like the you know to think about what does psychedelic culture mean what was what was the cultural impact of this discovery how did that affect culture in that and the reviewers just start out with I don't like drugs <laughs> and it's you know and that's that's so shallow that's such a shallow level of, of thinking that you know it's uh, it's frustrating yeah well when, t- when Twitter is such a huge thing and so many people get their news from 140 characters, that's, you know. Yeah, yeah and they're not haikus either or anything like that. You know, nobody's speaking in beautiful poetry on Twitter. Uh, all right. Well, we were just about out of time. Would you like to uh, tell people where they can find more on you? Uh, reality Sandwich. I do the Sci in the News uh you, that's realitysandwich.com? Realitysandwich.com. Yeah, and it's usually weekly, depending on if I have uh, breached the fringe too much or not. You know, then it may, sometimes it's bi-weekly or something. Uh, recently moving has held back the schedule on that. So um, the eyelessowl.net, um, liminal-analytics.org. I write regularly for disinfo.com. Um, semi-regularly for the Daily Grail. So I'm, I'm around. Usually if you Google David B. Metcalf, we'll call up my, my info. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you for such a fascinating discussion. Yeah. Well, thank, and thank you for letting me wander all, all over the place with this. Absolutely. That's what we're here for. <laughs> to explore. <laughs> all right. Last things for the Lost is up next. We're going to take you out with some Psyche Corporation. Thanks, David. Thanks, Ryan.